Oh, we've just reached 3 p.m. I believe we're ready to start. I think a few more participants will be joining us shortly, but I'll um, just run through a very quick introduction to, today, to today's event. Uh, welcome to everyone. I'm Zoe, Events Manager at Brand Finance. Thank you for joining our webinar today, Hollywood and Soft Power, featuring uh, Hollywood screenwriter Rob Long. We're pleased to be joined by over 100 people from all over the world for today's event. I will shortly be handing over to David Haig, CEO at Brand Finance, who will open today's event. Just a quick note on housekeeping. The format of the hour-long webinar today will follow a roughly 30-minute presentation by Rob Long, and then followed by a 25-minute Q&A discussion. You can submit all your questions to our presenters through um, the Q&A facility. We will be sharing a recording of the webinar after the session as well. And we'd also kindly request that on leaving the webinar today, you fill out a brief survey providing feedback that will be helpful to develop future webinars for brand finance. And uh, very finally, I would like to encourage you all to engage with us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter using our hashtag for this event, which is soft power. And now I'm very pleased to hand over to David Haig to start today's presentation. Oh, David, sorry, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, well, I think it forces me to very briefly introduce uh, Rob and why we invited him here today. Uh, I think you've already uh, mentioned that he's a writer and TV producer in Hollywood, uh, although now living in New York, and has been since 1990. As a screenwriter and executive producer for the long running show uh, Cheers, uh, he was nominated for Emmy and Gold Golden Globe Awards in 92 and 93, and then went on to write a series of other programs, uh, George and Leo, Love and Money, uh, men, women and dogs. Uh, and in addition to the TV work, uh, Rob uh, is a contributing editor for the National Review, uh, was originally a writer of the letters from Al, which were anonymous letters from uh, the fictional Al Gore, talking about various amusing uh, aspects of uh, the environment and so on, um, and is now the writer for The Long View in the National Review. Uh, he's also written for Time, Newsweek, Wall Street Journal and the LA Times. Uh, he hosts a syndicated weekly radio programme called Martini Shot, which apparently is a Hollywood term for the last shot of the day, when presumably everyone's gagging for a drink. Um, and maybe that should apply to this uh, event today, except that it's morning there, even though it's afternoon here. Um, and he appears regularly in political commentary shows, um, commenting on political events. Uh, in 2010, he took part in launching the centre-right commentary site Ricochet, uh, and has received awards from the Writers Guild of America and is a member of the board of the American Cinema Foundation. So really, we couldn't have found anyone more appropriate to actually talk to us about the power of American TV and cinema uh, in the whole so uh, soft power debate. Brand finance has been having this discussion for 15 years while we've been looking at nation brand uh, values and nation brand strengths, and particularly in the last two years, with our direct market research amongst very big audiences worldwide. And one of the key pillars of that whole uh, soft power debate is the influence of media. And so Rob has already uh, in the past commented on the soft power influence of Hollywood. And I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say and to starting the debate thereafter. Now, the, the, the final thing I'd say is that the, the reason I asked Rob actually, by a weird coincidence, on the very first day of brand finance 25 years ago, I was walking along the South Bank and I saw what looked like a very interesting event in the British Film Institute, where Rob was talking about his first book, which was called Conversations with My Agent, in which he talked about, about the vicissitudes of working in the Hollywood industry. And I sat there transfixed for two hours and then carried on with my business. And, and last year, I thought, well, it would be highly appropriate if in our 25th year, I could persuade Rob to speak for us. And so, I'm very, very pleased to say I, I finally have. Uh, now with that, I will hand to Rob, who will be the, the meat and potatoes, and then we can have a discussion. So thank you, Rob. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, I feel that, 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 uh, that I come out the loser here because I feel like I should be doing this in London, but unfortunately like the pandemic makes all this sort of, this is the best you get. Like you don't get a, you know, you don't get a dinner, you don't get a drink, you just, you know, just sit in front of a computer. Um, which by the way has made, I think the world incredibly more efficient and probably has a lot to do with a lot to do with what we're about to say. I mean, I think that probably we're about a year or two from, from, uh, from people making really interesting measurements on how much, how, how many improvements there are in the world media landscape, in the world business landscape because of COVID, which is sort of, uh, you know, a dark way to look at it. But 
it is sort of how we have to look at it. Um, so before I start, I just like, I, I pulled this out. I had this on the wall across the way and uh, I got this post. I think you can see it. I got this poster, this painting really here in North Korea and it's done the North Korean art uh, school um, in Pyongyang. You really can only paint, you know, one painting uh, <laughs> and it's got to be something like that. And I thought this would be a good, I just put the here over my shoulder so you could see it's just a giant fist smashing um, an American soldier with USA on it. This poor guy here. And that sort of is an idea, kind of a, a, a frame for what I want to say today, but also I think probably a very good, very good uh, symbol of sort of how people feel today in the United States, a little bit like they've been smashed down a bit. Um, so just a brief background about the way, way things work now and the way things work when I started. I started in 1990, so I'm old, although I was young in 1990 for my age, as they say. And uh, I worked, I, while I was a, a film student, um, uh, about 22 years old in, in Los Angeles at UCLA. And uh, I was in a writing workshop and someone said, um, you know, you, per, you write your little pieces and you read them in the writing workshop. And one of my fellow students thought I was, I don't know, she's trying to insult me, I guess. And she, she looked at my script after we read it and she said, this seems like television to me. Uh, and she meant that as an incredible insult, but I was just too dumb to realize it. So I thought, oh yeah, yeah, I guess it does seem like television. Uh, because at that time, there were two things that were interesting, right? One is that TV was like this sort of the, the, you know, the stepchild, the unwanted stepchild of the media business. Like the, it was, it wasn't, it was where movie stars went when they were over. Uh, it was very hard for a star to go from television to movies. That was very, very rare. Um, it was just this giant dividing line. And it was this something grand and glorious and evocative and emotional about going into a room that's dark and sitting in a plush seat and watching a, uh, image flickering on the screen versus sort of sitting in your underpants on the sofa watching just some television. And that was a big status difference. Now, and it's not just because of the pandemic, the movie theaters are closed. Everything is television. Everything appears on your screen at home. Uh, Warner Brothers a few weeks ago decided they were going to release all of their next movies on the home screen. Now, the difference is now the home screen in 1990 was about this big, and now it's this big. We've all seen TVs get larger and larger and larger and larger, and the sound get better and better and better and better. Um, so it's harder to make the argument that you need to get people in the theaters. So that's one big change. The second big change is that when I started, there were three, three and a half television networks that mattered in the United States. So that was a, an audience of about 250 million people at the time, maybe about 300. Uh, and the audience itself, um, you, you made a choice. You had four choices. Usually, you know, it's like the big three automakers in the old days, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. It was one of those three you were going to buy. You'd see, you could see a cop, you could see a, uh, a one-hour drama, like a cop show or a whodunit. You could see a comedy, or you could see a piece of news. Usually the news our segment on one on one network was sort of when they were punting, when they realized that they, were, they weren't going to be able to compete. Um, and this is kind of how the, those three big automakers divvied up the audience. Um, so I would come in. I was a staff writer on a, a very, very popular show called Cheers, which was did very well in Britain uh, and around the world. Um, and I would come in in the morning on Friday mornings. We were on Thursday nights at 9 p.m. And we get our ratings and our ratings would always be sort of like, well, you had about 29 or 30 million viewers and you had about a third, a little over a third of the audience. And we would sort of nod and then sort of go about our business. Um, now that those, those numbers are now astonishing. You just wouldn't get those. I mean, I don't think anything gets those numbers now. Um, but back then when you only have two major competitors, that's how you divvy up the audience. Now I just put, I, I put this up here. It's going to be my background for a second, just so you can see it. This is the, um, a friend of mine put this graphic together. This is the media universe today. So it went from three to this. And I don't know if you can, I think you can see this, right? So maybe it's backwards. I can't tell. Um, all of these are buyers and sellers and they're international and American, mostly American here but they're all buyers and sellers. And they include things like Google over here, which is Alphabet, which is backwards, Apple over here. These are, these are astonishing new developments in television production and television distribution um, that no one could bring. Amazon's here, uh, Facebook is here, and then all the other little constellations. So the most important thing to remember is we, we're in a universe now where there are uh, 10X, 20X, uh, producers and 
a, a larger worldwide global audience. The only thing that stayed the same, and this is sort of the important thing, the only thing that has stayed the same over the years has been there are still 24 hours in a day. So if people are going to sleep and eat and go to work, they still only have a certain amount of time during the day to do that uh, and to watch your television, watch your movies. That, that scarcity isn't changing. And so what you end up with is a very, very, very competitive business with a very, 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 very tiny margins and, um, and then a, a much larger upside, but also um, uh, it, it costs a lot of money to be in this business. And that's part of the fun of, if you're a writer or producer, part of the fun of it. There are a lot of buyers. So that, that's, that's from 1990 to now. That's sort of what, what that's kind of my, my first point. Um, and the second point I'd say is this. In 2000, right after 9-11, 2001, um, the mood in Hollywood was in American media was like, why don't you let us um, to the government? Why don't you let us help us sell America to the world? The world seems to hate us. Why don't we use our soft power, Hollywood soft power to sort of promote the American way of life, to promote the, whatever the American virtues are that you choose. Uh, and the government um led by the then the a, a presidential advisor named named Karl Rove came to Hollywood and he convened a giant meeting and everybody in Hollywood the people in, in, in the show business tend to be extremely pompous about what they do and who they are and so a lot of them were saying things like well you know we're the storytellers we're like the shaman by the campfire we're the ones who create the images and the stories and the dramas and the comedies that people love we America's biggest export is entertainment uh, we are the entertainment uh, uh, provider and producer for the world. Everyone in the world wants to watch Hollywood product. Uh, you should come and let us help you. So Carl Rove arrived and I was there at this big giant big meeting and he had one request for Hollywood. He said, listen, uh, we're obviously gonna be deploying troops, more troops around the world. We would love it if you could give us early releases of your movies to show on, you know, air, in military bases and aircraft carriers. And that was it, that's all he wanted. and people in Hollywood were really surprised. Like they thought that we were all gonna be part of this you know, grand uh, propaganda campaign like in World War II. Until it dawned on them that like, actually all of their, prim all of their prior, uh, what, prior convictions about Hollywood and its power were wrong. Um, it's Bollywood, not Hollywood that is bigger. It is Bollywood, not Hollywood that reaches more eyeballs. It's Bollywood, not Hollywood that has the biggest stars. I mean, Tom Cruise is a big star, Brad Pitt's a big star, but they're not as big as Riddick Roshan or Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, just because Rithik Roshan can walk down the street here on 11th Street in New York, where I am, or, or, or Shah Rukh Khan for that matter, and probably not get mobbed, is not a sign that he's not the, one of the most famous or two of the most famous people in the world. Um, so that was a sort of a surprise for a lot of people in Hollywood. And then, as you see, as the sort of global marketplace expanded, um, things changed, right? So now we have Netflix and Apple, and I'll show you this little bit here. Uh, and Amazon and places like that who run exclusively global businesses. They can only make money if they run global businesses. Um, and this is going to be a terrible, terrible graphic. And I apologize for the fact that I'm such an idiot. I did it backwards because I didn't know how to. But all right. So here, these are, um, well, I don't know why I looked over there. So, um, this is all in a mirror and I apologize. But these are the Netflix biggest shows, foreign shows. And they are, in fact, really interesting. If you're, I mean, there are people from all over the uh, the world here. Um, the biggest Netflix biggest shows in the United States, non English shows in the United States, top ten: Barbarians from Germany, The Rain from Denmark, Dark from Germany, Money Heist from Spain. That's number four, which I think actually that's higher now. This is about a, a month old. Um, Dark Desire from Mexico. Uh, Ragnarok from Norway, Always a Witch from Columbia. These are all here. And then the top, Netflix's top 10 non-English films in the films in the US, The Platform, Lost Bullet, Rogue City, Alive, IP Man 4, which is, an, IP Man is actually a very interesting, um, I don't know if you've seen it, it's a very interesting um, phenomenon. Uh, all of those things are astonishing for American media. Um, the idea that anyone would sit and watch a foreign television show or a foreign movie at home um, was just unthinkable 10 years ago. Uh, that is a sign of the new uh, entertainment, global entertainment complex. Um, Americans are watching more foreign um, television and movies, and non-Americans are watching 
probably fewer American uh, products because you see as as the as the pull from the United States increases, production overseas increases. So there's more overseas for them to watch and for us to watch. And so that's why I kind of, I mean, maybe I dissent on the soft power idea. I'm ne I've never really understood what soft power was or why it seems like a thing we made up. It seems like a thing that a smart professor made up, uh, frankly. <laughs> um, I understand hard power. I get that. If you're um, North Korea, you um, hard power is really easy. You don't need to, I don't need to watch a North Korean movie or, or buy a North Korean um, uh, uh, painting. Um, I can just simply, uh, I'm, I'm trying to putting this thing back in. I can simply um, uh, make a missile, right? That's what, that's what they do. That's all they do. They just, that's hard power. And I think hard power is probably ultimately more useful. Um, Soft power seems to me to be the revert, working in the reverse in the United States. It isn't, a, it isn't a power that the United States projects. It's, it's a receiving of external and outside production. It, there's a gigantic appetite for it. It might have to go through a translator. It might have to go through a dubbing. It might have to be repurposed or, re, or the format purchased and then put on American television as, as a, sort of an Americanized. That's possible too. We've done that overseas all the time. I mean, there's... American sitcoms in Moscow and Istanbul uh, that are Turkish with Turkish actors, but they are recognizably the American sitcom. That happens all the time. And so I wanted to sort of, uh, I, I don't want to go too long here, but I did want, I want to, well, the, the third sort of image I think um, that we want to think about is in 2008, uh, right as the financial collapse hit, so the November of the financial collapse, which was in, in the teeth of it. Uh, I had some time, so I took a container ship. I rode in a container ship, not in a container, but like in a little cabin they have, from Seattle uh, to Shanghai. And it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most, I think it is the most trafficked trade route in the world, in world history. Um, Shanghai to Long Beach Port, the Port of Los Angeles, to Oakland, to Seattle, to um, Busan, North Korea, South Korea, sorry, <laughs> Busan, uh, Tian Shan, I think, was is um, Hong Kong, and then Shanghai, and then back, just giant loop. And so I hitched a ride from Seattle to Shanghai, in the teeth of the global economic collapse, um, which means one thing really, which is that nobody's in a hurry. They don't tell you that when you get on the boat, but there's nobody's in a hurry. So the word came from Hamburg: don't go. Here's the you don't go faster than X number of knots. Don't waste fuel. Just get to uh, Shanghai at some point. There's not much to pick up to take back to the United States because everything's slowed down. And what I thought was interesting about that is that that is kind of where we are right now in the entertainment business. Uh, after a year of a pandemic and a year of shutdown, and then another a new shutdown started this month in Los Angeles. Production halted in, in the city, in the city and the county. Um, the pipeline is very small. Uh, it's very, very tight. Um, the, the ships aren't running. So the, the vacuum is going to be filled by something. And, um, right now it's being filled by enormous amount of foreign content, an enormous amount of, uh, of, of new kinds of ideas from other countries, uh, other shows that are being dubbed or just put on. I mean, there are Americans here watching a French comedy called, um, uh, D. Prosson, which is me, uh, call my agent. I think they're calling it in, in English, call my agent. And it's a French comedy. And um, I'll do respect to the French who I love. I'm a huge fan. I'm a giant Francophile. They're not the, f they're not the funniest people. Um, they don't, there's a, there's a certain quality to French comedy that it's, it's usually, you know, a farce, right? It's the Fado farce. It's, uh, you know, my, my wife is coming up the grand staircase. My mistress is in the bedroom. She's going to hide behind the curtain and I'm going to, that's the front. This is a more sophisticated, more, frankly, more English uh, tone. Um, and I think it's the product of this mix, this general marketplace. If you consume enough of somebody else's material, you start to appreciate their way of telling a story. Um, 
in, in, in terms of punching above its weight, I think Great Britain is the master of that. This is a fairly small country with an enormous cultural footprint. Um, partly that's because it's in English, but partly it's because um, they just have been doing it really well for a while. Um, so that, so th th that's sort of, I mean, I just wanted to, I want to talk about the, the, what I would consider just a, the soft power myth, which is that I don't think it's something that in the United States anyway, that's being projected. I think it's something that's being received. Um, and that's enormously exciting for the audience. And then a, just a final, just way to look at the media landscape that I just put up this this gigantic constellation. All of that is competition. All of that means that something that some kind of something has to happen economically for these businesses to work. And what has to happen is the costs have to go down because the risks are going up and the margins are getting skinny and you got to bring the cost down somewhere. Uh, and where that's going to come down is in production. The amount of production will be high. I mean, right now in New York City and LA, and I think in London, it's very, very difficult to, 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 for, to find space to produce um, a movie or TV show because all the sound stages are being used. But it also means that you have to be willing to do everything cheaper, not just renting a soundstage, but also paying your actors less, paying your writers and directors less, paying your executives less. This is, these are tougher, tougher businesses. Um, and my example to that is this. Uh, I had a friend who uh, he had two brothers and they were sort of entrepreneurs in Ohio. And uh, they, um, they found an old um, uh, sort of a, a, a food manufacturing facility that was for sale. They bought it and they started making a thing. They put in a jar, which was like a, 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 a vinegary salad, like a bean and broccoli salad, but in a jar that's been pickled. It's actually not bad. It sounds terrible, but it's actually pretty good. And they started making it and um, it's popular. And they sold it to all these little stores in Ohio and they sold it to the some of the bigger departments, some of the bigger grocery stores in Ohio. And then one day someone from Walmart came and knocked on their door and said, we want to put your three bean salad in our Walmart. Which they thought, this is thrilling. This is a fantastic. They're like, they've made it. But what they forgot about Walmart is that Walmart's very smart. So Walmart calculated, I think, to the quarter of a cent what it costs them to produce one jar and then said, we will pay you a half a cent more. That's going to be your margin. We're going to order a bajillion of these, of these three bean salad jars, but we're only going to pay you. You're only going to make a half a cent on each one. And if you say no to this, we will find someone else to do it. So, of course, they said yes. And they're immensely rich now, but they are exhausted because every year Walmart comes back to them and says, remember your margin of half a cent? Now it's three quarters of a cent. And it keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until they simply can't do it. But of course you could always do it because the, 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 the volume is huge. And that is what's happening to Hollywood, it, American entertainment industry. The margins are getting uh, slammed, cl closed because of, all the competition, all the choice, international entertainment product, and something's going to have to give. So what you're going to be watching for the next two years, three years, is costs going, being squeezed, probably some labor trouble, probably a lot of volatility in those companies. They're getting larger. They're going to get smaller. They're going to be new players. They're going to be some combinations we didn't expect. Um, and all of that's going to be uh, going to be part of, I think, what you might, what I guess you want to call soft power, but I would call the, the opening up and the globalization, even though it's a terrible word, of the entertainment business. Um, it's going to be very, very good for viewers, for the audience. More choice is good. It's nice to go to Walmart and buy three bean salad that's cheap. Sure. It's going to be tougher for people in Hollywood. And I always say as a joke, it's going to be harder for people in Hollywood because they're going to have to make money in the old fashioned way, they're gonna to have to earn it, which is not something we're used to do, <laughs> we're used to doing. We were the big three, we could sort of sit on our laurels. Um, so the soft power here, that's the fist is world, worldwide entertainment production, TV shows and movies being made in countries that didn't have an entertainment business five, six, 10 years ago, smashing the uh, traditional Hollywood behemoth. And the traditional Hollywood behemoths, the big studios and the streaming services are already preparing to be less American, less 
national and more international. And that can't, I don't think that can be a bad thing. I think it can be a really great thing. Um, I mean, <laughs> I write comedy, so it's harder for me. Comedy is a hard time translating. Comedy has a hard time crossing borders. Mostly um, what people like are dramas, cop shows, whodunits, things I can understand. I don't need to know. There's no wordplay necessary. It's easy to dub. It's easy to subtitle. It's just easier to watch. And the final example I'll use is um, an obscure American sport from the 19th century called basketball that then became a very popular, but not the most popular American sport in the 20th century, in the first part of the 20th century anyway, and became mostly a college, something people played in university sport, and a very specific sport until really until the 1980s, at which point the actual organization, the National Basketball Association, started to look at their business and think, well, we're in the entertainment business. How, how can we optimize our play and our players and our games to be appealing worldwide? And they did a lot of things in terms of brand relationships. They did a lot of things in terms of endorsements. But the one advantage they had at the very beginning was that the ball is this big. And there are only five players on each side at any given time. And the court's not that large. And you can see everyone's face. And you can watch the ball. It's not hard. You watch, if you watch hockey, ice hockey, it's, sometimes you have no idea where the puck is. You always know where it is in basketball. Basketball is a much better show. And it's much more human because you see the faces of the people. You see their emotion of the, of the athletes much more closely than you do in soccer. And that was the beginning when they realized that they had a star in every, on every court and a show that people could watch and that you didn't have to speak English and you didn't really have to understand how it worked. You just had to watch these athletes run and do then basketball took off. And then you saw, then you see people in China and in Africa and in South America watching American basketball. Um, and that will ultimately be something that other nations will figure out. How, what's our show? How, what's our, what's the best show we have? What, what is a show that you don't have that you could watch with a sound off and love? Um, and those are going to be the winners in the future. Oh, I've gone too long. I'm going to shut up now. But thank you for listening. And I, I got some more stories okay. to do this later. Well, that, that was a very interesting uh, <clears throat> startup uh, discussion. So um, I've got quite a few questions coming in from various people that we can uh, uh, chew over. But let me start with one, which is, um, I think it's fair to say that after the last war and probably even before the last, sorry, the Second World War, um, Hollywood did become dominant and had lots of money and, you know, the infrastructure and was churning out the movies and had a pretty much of a free run in a lot of places. Eventually, Bollywood came along, but uh, most of the world film industry was, was oriented on America. And I think a, a lot of countries, whether it's true or it isn't true, believe that exporting your culture in the end helps you to influence people. And A, it creates jobs, but also it, it creates influence. So many foreign countries, including Britain, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and various others have heavily subsidized the film industry, either through, through um, tax breaks or direct subsidies. And I think you can now see that happening much more actively, you know, places like China, uh, right. Turkey, the Middle East, they all think, right, let's put money into this because it will export our culture and then people will like us and listen to what we have to say. Um, what do you think about that? Because I don't, I don't suppose America does that. So is it going to lose out? Well, I mean, I mean, we do it. In, we do it internally. I mean, the states here compete viciously for that kind of. They do exactly the same thing. They compete viciously for uh, production to move to its state. I mean, I think um, there was a uh, at some point, I believe, at the end of the summer, um, the governors of Texas and Florida were each competing, going to Los Angeles and Georgia too, to compete to say, "Listen, our pandemic numbers are so much lower." And the governor, I think the government of Florida, it might have been Georgia, actually offered the studio, said, listen, if you move your productions here, 
we won't subsidize you any more than we're doing now, but we will indemnify you against any kind of COVID related lawsuit, employee lawsuit. So, you know, the gaffer comes in, he gets COVID, he's going to sue the studio for making him work uh, in a place that's unsafe, uh, the stu- which is a very, very real fear for the studios. And the governor of, te- of Florida or Georgia was saying, I'll, I'll take care of whatever the settlement is. And it was extremely attractive. Um, I think a month later, the COVID numbers went up. And so that, that sort of was off the table. But people do compete. Um, the only economic um, analysis I've ever seen about this has suggested that it actually is kind of a boondoggle, that it's great for the, great for the studios and the productions. It doesn't really translate into building capacity in the country. Um, that could be true. I, I, it is a very important part of deciding where you're shooting, if you're shooting a feature film or a series. Uh, because everybody likes free money. But I think, I'm not sure that's the best way to build capacity for mm-hmm. your, your material. Like the best way to do it is to do some great, great stuff. And now you don't well, need actually, that, on that sub- cheaper now. On, on that subject, I was gonna raise another question that was asked earlier on by Ian Wood, I think, um, which is with the proliferation of so much content, you're spreading the the the, the uh, talent very thin, and yeah. are we going to see a deterioration in quality across the board, or because it's now much more accessible, are we going to get loads more talent coming in? Uh, what, what, what do you think? Well, I think it's that the question is whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, and I'm an optimist. I think that more people there's. I, I think that talent is distributed widely and randomly all over the country, all over the world, um, and I don't think that. <laughs> everyone in Hollywood or Bollywood or Pinewood Studios or wherever the media center you're choosing, they're not necessarily the most talented people in the room. Um, the, the best news for entrepreneurs and for young people who want to get into the entertainment world is that the, the, the cost of joining it, the cost of entering it, the cost of creating a product has been reduced by 95%. It's easier for you to film. It's easier for you to score. It's easier for you to distribute. This is, this is an unalloyed good. Um, the, the question I think for nations is, uh, that's why I didn't, didn't, I mentioned Ip Man, I didn't go back to it, is that uh, is what, what can a movie do for you if you have a cultural, if you're a country that has a cultural goal? And Ip Man is a very interesting, I don't know if you've seen it, it's a, it's, there's four of them or five of them maybe. The, but they are um, they're the story, true story-ish, true, true-ish story of the man who then, who ended up in Hong Kong running um, a martial arts studio, a dojo, and his star student was Bruce Lee. So it starts sometime, uh, you know, pre-World War II, pre-Japanese invasion. And it is a deeply patriotic, Chinese patriotic, mainland Chinese patriotic movie. It's about driving out the invader it's about a, a, a unified cultural identity, which is, you know, some Chinese history. They didn't really have. This is kind of a manufactured identity. And, and it is a very, and by the way, the movies are fantastic, but it, there, is a, there is a cultural goal to that that I think may be closer to what, if, if, if you want to build something in, in, your, in your country, in your government, that's probably how you have to do it. You have to sort of tell, tell the stories of your nation. So um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I read a thing in the paper that yesterday, actually, that um, uh, Netflix is crucifying the studios because the studios have got all these constraints you talked about and that they were only scheduled to be producing up to 20 films this year, most of the major studios. Most of them are delayed or, you know, they'll be yeah. in the single digit of films and that Netflix is bringing out 50 and that they're going for it because basically the, the studios rely on cinemas, whereas Netflix just relies on the TV. Um, is that going to happen? Is Netflix going to crush them the way that Amazon has crushed everybody else in the retail world? Well, it's sort of, an, that's an interesting question. The, 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 the biggest shows right now, the biggest, the, the most popular shows on streaming services on Amazon and Netflix are reruns of American sitcoms. So the subscribers to these services, when they click on Netflix, more often than not, they're watching a rerun of an American sitcom, which all of the, which Netflix and Amazon, the light, their license, what they will, they'll lose it soon. They're not going to be allowed to do that. Um, Netflix has been in a sort of a death race for a long time, because at first 
typical for these sort of sclerotic and fat studios. They didn't see that there's going to be there's any streaming business at all. So this Netflix company that basically rented you a DVD now wants to put it on the internet. Fine. Um, and they licensed a lot of their content to Netflix for very cheap. So they essentially, because they're, you know, not very forward thinking, they subsidized the development of their major competitor. Netflix, when everybody realized they were doing that, they decided, well, we're never, we're not going to re, we're not going to re up those licenses. And Netflix realized they had about a three or four or five year runway where they needed to build up their own library because this library was going away. Uh, and it's been, I think this is now year five, year six. It's, you can you start seeing movies that you were sure were on Netflix disappear and TV shows that you were sure were on Netflix disappear. And Netflix is now trying to build up their own titles. What's, re, what's interesting is that even today, Netflix is still heavily reliant on old reruns of sitcoms. Um, and, and I'll make this it, prediction. Here, here's my bold prediction is that the, the, the entertainment business only works if you also are selling something else. So movies in 1930s, 1940s, and even today only work as a business because I'm also going to sell you some very expensive candy and a soda, you know, a, a Coca-Cola that cost me one half of one cent, but I'm going to charge you $2 for it. And so the, the theater owners get a little bit and then they give a little bit back to the studios and the studios get to build a, the, everyone. There's, there's a multiple sources of income in, in, the, in the project. Apple, Apple can last forever, right? They don't care. They just, they just want you to watch it on an iPhone or an iPad or something like that. They, they're selling something else. They're selling Apple TV units. Warner Brothers is owned by AT&T. So if I go to my AT&T store and I buy a iPhone or I buy long distance service from them, they'll give me a, They'll give me Warner Brothers, HBO Max, it's called, for free. And Amazon, we know Amazon's going to sell you everything you want and deliver it to your, to your door the next, in the next hour. Netflix is going to have a little – Netflix is trying to do something that no one in the entertainment business has ever done in the history of the entertainment business, which is to make money only on entertainment. That's a very, very – and we, we don't think of it that way, but it's true. It's very, very – I would say Netflix is probably going to have to combine with somebody soon. It, it's interesting, actually, because one of the things they say about music streaming services is that people go on to, you know, one of these streaming services and um, the big stars tend to dominate and the oh. small stars are getting paid very little. And there's so much of it that and it's not curated in a particularly good way. So nobody knows who they are. <laughs> so actually, although there is proliferation of content, um, it isn't actually helping a lot of them now. Is there an equivalence there with, uh, with with the film and TV industry? Because, you know, I always feel when you're looking at Netflix, you just don't know where to start. There's so much of it, it's impossible to choose. And they try and give you these um, uh, functions that will allow you to choose what you like. And they try and predict what you'd like, but, you know, it's hopeless. Um, how do you see that developing as a way of, um, you know, what's, how should one put it? Helping the viewer, but also bringing out the quality. The, the, um, the traditional way was, you know, some guy does it. Some guy, at a, it was always a guy, president of some network, picks the show he likes. And then they came up with a kind of a totem, weird kind of cargo cult, kind of shamanistic way where they go to a focus group and they would pretend that's scientific, right? Which, of course, it's not. Uh, and now the, the and Silicon Valley responded by saying, well, we don't even need to do that because you'll crowdsource the popular shows. They'll just come rise to the top because more they get more likes or whatever. And that doesn't seem to work either with a giant fire hose of information. What we might go back to, I mean, the, I, my general theory is that we end up reinventing what we already had with a slight change after this giant, you know, we call it a giant revolution. Um, Netflix right now, I think it's in France, is experimenting with a essentially a programmed service that would be broadcast with ads so you can tune in and it, it gives you certain shows in it has a schedule you don't get to pick it's picked for you with ads um that is television that's broadcast television netflix has now reinvented the old broadcast television model <laughs> and they think of themselves as innovating but in fact it's exactly the same thing um and I suspect it'll be more of that. I don't think anyone is going to be able to make it uh, unless they have 
some other business. And if that business is not uh, selling you computers or phones or services, it will be selling you ads. Um, so so let, I, let, me jump, let me jump to a couple of uh, editorial or sort of um, content questions. Uh, what, the, the first one is, um, it, it was always said that Hollywood used to characterize uh, heroes and villains by their nationality. And you know, like the baddie, the baddie was always British or German. Yeah. The goodie was always American and so on. Yeah. Um, do you see that continuing or is it going to change in any way? Oh, no, it'll continue. It's, um, if the, Donald I don't Trump think the baddies. It'll be Chinese, wouldn't they? Well, uh, no. Um, the baddies um, uh, always have English accents, but they're not English. Often they're just something else with an English accent. Um, choosing the baddies has been really, really difficult. I mean, even in the Cold War, in the, in the, in the James Bond movies, the Russians were never bad. Uh, they were always compromised in some way, just like us. It was a very John le Carré view of the world, which is like, it's a, just a sick world and we have to join together to, to fight this, frankly, a capitalist oligarch, Blofeld, right? That was like, he was just wanted money and to control the world. Um, the, all, whenever the Soviets appear in James Bond movies, they're always as reluctant partners. We're going to have to partner up on this. The spy who loved me from Russia would love all that stuff. And then um, that seemed to be kind of, well, and so it seemed a little gauche, maybe a little like em embarrassing, a little sort of, you know, middle-class American to be sort of anti-Russian. So we had to find some other villains. Um, and those villains were usually rapacious capitalists or, um, there's a brief period where they were Islamic terrorists. And what's interesting about that was they were Islamic terrorists until there was, they were actual Islamic terrorists to, to point to, and then they stopped. So there were two or three movies in which the terrorists were, um, um, kind of Islamic fundamentalists, but I'm trying to think of like, I'm almost all of them. There was somebody behind them who was doing it for money. Hollywood pretty much wrote the villains were always doing it for money. No one was ever moved by ideology. And now they're all Russian. And everybody agrees the Russians are terrible. So every, every time you hear a Russian or see a Russian or you hear somebody speaking with a Russian accent in any American movie, you know that person's the villain. Just So, you can, so it's not going to change. They're, they're still going to be picking on nationalities. And, you know, it, like, yeah, well, the ones that they, – then they will, it won't be the Chinese because the Chinese are um, strategic investors and they're a giant market. Right. So I'll, I mean, right. I can maybe I'll, I'll just I can just tell you one sort of off sort of off the record. I don't know why I'm doing this on Zoom. This is what I've heard that um, the, when they're choosing the next James Bond, obviously there's lots of interest in who the next James Bond's going to be. Um, and there was a big movement for it that it should be Idris Elba, who is this you know fantastic British actor, very popular in American audience, been American television, really great, but he is black. And everybody thought, this is great. Like, this would be a very cool new way of looking at James Bond. Good. And he's obviously, he could do action adventure. He'll be terrific. And then it went away for a while because of the Chinese. And the question wasn't whether the Chinese audiences would accept a black James Bond. The problem is that James Bond, the character, sells an enormous amount of products around the world we may not see. And in China, James Bond drinks doers and he drinks some kind of Japanese soda and he doesn't wear an Omega watch. He wears the whatever watch, Chinese watch. He does, there's a lots, of, lots of things that the person who plays James Bond advertises. And China advertisers and China brands, Chinese brands didn't think that a black spokesman would be popular in China. So there's a casting decision <clears throat> based not on an audience, but based on the brand marketing uh, ramifications, which is astonishing. So, so the other, the other uh, editorial sort of content thing I was going to talk about was that um, <clears throat> it, it, it would appear that a lot of franchises become more simplistic with simpler vocabulary and are more visual the whole time. So whether it's uh, comedy, you know, like with Mr. Bean or James right. Bond, which is virtually has no script anymore, it's all just action. Um, and it seems as though um, uh, movie production is, is um, going to two extremes. You, you've either got the quirky, intelligent, good stuff coming from a variety of countries, or these fairly dull um, uh, blockbusters that, that have no real content. I mean, do you see that happening? 
further? Is it is that what's going to happen? Well, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, there's always a pendulum with these things. I mean, I think the problem is that that the um, in in movie production, TV production, you're, what you're looking for is the the the, the flywheel, you're looking for the, the the part of the machine that you don't you can just turn off your brain, you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, I mean, that's what everybody in in, in product production is looking for. Like, how do I get this and then just repeat this and don't have to think about it? I, don't, I can't reinvent a car every time I make a car. And so this natural impulse in, in, in Hollywood, especially, to try to figure out what's the formula and make sure it's in there and then the people will buy it. So if you were, if you created a very, very, very popular movie a few years ago called Wonder Woman, that was a gigantic blockbuster people loved. It was a pretty good movie. Then you think, okay, give me that. Just update a little bit, put a little few twists in, and then out it goes the factory door, and which they did. And then they released it um, on, you know, on HBO Max, I think it was HBO Max. Um, Warner Brothers released it online, and it was a disaster. People hated it. Now, I don't know whether it's measurably worse than what happened before, but they were bored with it. And so you can't, you, the, the unfortunate truth for the entertainment business is that you have no idea what people will watch or like. You have no idea that there's a, that if there's a formula or what that formula might be. You simply have to risk it each time. And that's why it's a tough business. That's why the ROI in Hollywood has always been really low. Nobody's ever really talked about that, but it's not a great business. If you've got a billion dollars you want to invest in something, don't make movies, right? So I say it's like, you know, how do you make a, a small fortune in the entertainment business? Well, you first have to start with a large fortune. That's the right. way it works. So why would you – but – but that's why the so I think there's enormous amount of a be, enormous amount of opportunity for small budget, quiet dramas, thrillers, people shooting things something on their iPhone, and that the next big global hit will be that. That that, that comment you just made the moment ago about if you want to be a millionaire, start as a billionaire, um, <laughs> is a good segue into Donald Trump, really, isn't it? So uh, given where we are, it would be impossible not to actually ask you um, what effect do you think he's had on American culture, the American brand and, you know, the shenanigans in the last month? Uh, you know, what, 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 do, what do you really think? Do you think America will recover or is this uh, going to be long term damage? The weird thing to most foreigners is that uh, the number of people who still seem to support him. Could you kind of elucidate and explain why all this is? Well, I can't explain why it is because I have no idea why it is. It seems it's baffling to me too. Um, I, I, I think American culture has two schizophrenic projections, right? One is powerful, buttoned up, ruthlessly efficient. Uh, you know, we can send a tiny missile into your bedroom window from space guided by somebody sitting in Oklahoma city. That is literally true. Mm -hmm. But we also have this noisy, chaotic, sometimes vulgar, uh, unsophisticated culture that we just spew out. Uh, and sometimes it ends up being brilliant and fantastic, and it's a John Ford movie or something like that, or it's a great TV show. And sometimes it ends up being astonishingly awful, and you can't believe how bad it is. Sometimes it ends up inspiring four young guys in Liverpool to create the Beatles, and sometimes it inspires somebody to put on a weird, you know, Viking horns and go and storm the capital. I, I think that... Um, I think this is an opportunity, maybe it's organic, for the rest of the world, you know, after when this is happening, for the rest of the world to move forward culturally. Um, but the, but do, you think, do, you, do you think, do you think, do you think but, there's been lasting damage to America's reputation? Because I think in the old days, everybody assumed America had the perfect democracy. And, you know, what's happened in the last four years is sort of uh, unraveled in a bit. It's a bit it's a bit similar to the UK when we went through our ruptures about, about Brexit, where nobody quite understood how our political system worked. 
and, and thought it was ludicrous that we were describing it as the mother of parliaments when it didn't seem to know what it was doing. Uh, and uh, America, se America seems to have um, yeah. <clears throat> got itself into a similar position. I mean, how, how can that be resolved, given that the underlying uh, conflict with, with, with the Trump supporters has not really gone away? I mean, the, it seems like the country yeah. divided halfway down the middle. Well, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I don't really know. Um, I, 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 um, I mean, there, there are two questions, right? One is the brand America. How's that? Has that been stained? And I think un, undeniably it's been stained. Undeniably it's been um, taken down. I mean, I think Americans feel that. In fact, you, you can feel the shame that patriotic and nation loving Americans feel for what happened, certainly the past mm. four years. Right. Um, and and you can tell the sh you can, I mean I'm not I'm not licensed to practice psychiatry but you can tell that the shame is internalized in a lot of Trump supporters because of their aggressive behavior like you only are that neurotically obsessed with a leader if you've got some psychological problems going on right in your life there's some issue there um so I think the brand has been hurt I really do in terms of the interior in internal politics um it, uh, the, the, this, I believe this is a market failure. The American people are in fact consistently have voted for the past 30 years for a kind of a split half-half, you know, a little bit namby-pamby, lukewarm government. That's kind of what they want. They kind of want something kind of big squishy in the middle. They don't want it too far right. They don't want it too far left. They just want the big squishy thing in the middle. And they consistently vote for that. They vote maybe for a crackpot weirdo for president, but then they vote for left wing in the Congress. They do that. I mean, Wisconsin voters went into Wisconsin. I mean, Wisconsin's the sort of bedrock America. That is like Central America. And they went in, Wisconsin Republicans went in to the voting booth in November and they voted for Joe Biden or they left that blank and then they voted for their Republican congressman. So the American people, the audience is actually pretty much where you want them to be. They're just not being served right. And like the, the, the way I would compare that to Hollywood is or to, to entertainment business is that when you have, when, when your audience is doing that, they're trying to have a conversation with you. They're trying to tell you what they want. And you may not hear that. And there's a lot of structures and, and systems in place to keep these big parties from understanding that or taking the risk. But the person who does take the risk is the biggest winner. The most powerful politician in America today is the Senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. He's a Democrat. He's very conservative. He's from a conservative state. He never became a Republican. They always wanted him to come over and listen, you're really a Republican. You're basically conservative. He didn't do it. And now he is sitting as the Senator from West Virginia and he represents most of middle America. Not, not that far right, not that far left. And he is absolutely, absolutely in the perfect position because all the parties are coming and begging him. They need his one vote. Well, it's interesting. I think a lot of people over here <clears throat> would always historically have regarded America as very right wing or pretty right wing. Yeah. And that the, the Democrats were about as right wing as the Tories and <laughs> the Republicans were even further right. But yeah. they all kind of agreed with each other about everything like free enterprise. Um, and one of the things which seems to have changed is, is there's much more of a polarization between Bernie Sanders type socialism and, and you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, and so it's, it's much more fractured. And just coming back to the issue about the entertainment industry. I think certainly what, what goes around in America is people believe that the entertainment industry on the West and the East Coast is largely dominate, dem, um, dominated by lefties. You know, yeah. it's almost back back to the 50s with, uh, you know, the um, Joe McCarthy, you know, like, right. um, <clears throat> have you are, are you now or have you ever been a communist? Um, do, do you actually think that that, that that that's a, that's a thing? That, that um, One of the questions that came through said, that um, as a result of the Iraq war and similar wars, uh, there have been a lot of films that have been very anti-American produced in America and yeah. nearly all of them flopped at the box office. And I think the question was driving at the fact that the left-wing establishment in the media industry is producing these things, but they bomb because nobody's interested in them. Uh, is that a fair comment or not? I think it's fair. I, I, I'm not sure that it's, that, that I, you, you wouldn't have to put a label on it. I think it's fair because people don't like a message they just don't i mean they want a story um tell me a story that's what i want to see uh and hollywood that's what we do we tell stories and when you start your storytelling 
with the, the your primary goal is to convince you of some position, I'm, I, you can smell it a mile away. I mean, the uh, the uh, the example I use is that in the early 1970s there was a it was a there was a British show called um, um, Step to not Step to Son it was All in the Family I forget what it's called in Britain it was a it was a sitcom family sitcom mm -hmm. crusty conservative father his daughter marries a flaming liberal they live in the house all they do is argue about politics till death has to part till death do us part right. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, in the, we took it in the United States, and they called it All in the Family, and it was a gigantic hit, and it was it was it was on a network that was liberal. It, it was a very left wing uh, showrunner, creator, writer. All the staff were like you know bleeding heart liberals, and they created this caricature of a right wing kook from Queens, which is sort of interesting, right? Well, we have another one, right, <laughs> from Queens, Donald Trump. And they made and they gave and they thought we're going to skewer this attitude. And it turned out the American people watched the show and thought, I like that guy, I like that old guy. Yeah, he's a little bit, he goes a little bit too far, maybe, but I kind of like him because they didn't realize that actually, if you create a character who talks that way, but he's the one with not one job but two jobs. He's the one who went to war. He's the one who's like pays the mortgage for the house. He does all the work. A lot of Americans thought, well, you know, he may be wrong about this or that or integration or whatever, but he's the one paying the bills. And so the liberals were surprised by the fact that they created a conservative hero and they were, that was not their intent. So yeah, that, that's I would always that's say, tell the story first. They, they, they won't yeah. allow them to play the reruns on that anymore. Oh, so, oh no, yeah. no, no. Oh my God. No, that's, that's, never... that's verboten now. Oh, absolutely. You but know, you can... it, 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 we've got a few more minutes left. So I'd just like to, there are two things that I'd like to finish with. One is, you know, this whole stuff about Trump and it hasn't all played out yet. Yeah. Do you think it's going to produce a lot of interesting films? I mean, I know there's been a lot of media coverage already, but, you know, what's been going on in the last few days it sounds like the script of a film, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it does. And I think um, in a weird psychological, psych psychic way or psychological way or psychotic way, I should say, the people who were, storm who were doing that, storming it and rioting, felt like they were stars in a movie. I mean, a lot of them are part of this conspiracy theory called QAnon, which is this, it's impossible to describe, but it's this like oh, oh, universal conspiracy theory that includes people like the Queen of England and Vladimir Putin and uh, the reinvented, reanimated corpse of Hugo Chavez and the American government. It's crazy, right? The most interesting thing about QAnon is it is a conspiracy theory, the only one in my, uh, to my knowledge, that has a happy ending. The conspiracy is all of this is terrible and Trump's going to fix it. This is very strange. Most conspiracy theories are like, you'll never know the truth, right? But this is the, and so a lot of those people really felt like they're part of this. This is a great big moment in American history and I'm part of it. This is my tea party. This is my whatever. Um, so they were, they, they do feel like they're in a movie. I'm not sure that there'll be movies based on this because we've already seen it on television a million times. But what will be interesting, just to go back to the pandemic is when the pipeline dries up, you quickly need to fill it. And the traditional development process for a movie or TV show is, you know, six months or something, three, whatever it is, it takes forever. Everybody has their fingers in the pie. Everybody tells you what they want. Everybody want to change this character, change that character. It's this constant, constant development process. We call it development hell, right? Because it's just executives peppering you with notes. But the minute the pandemic is, or the minute there are enough people who are vaccinated and production starts again, the word's going to come down. We need, don't, just rush everything into development, rush everything to the soundstage. We need more content. And the outcome is going to be a lot of really weird stuff, right? A lot of stuff that like probably is weird. Like it's going to be, we're going to start seeing that in about a year, maybe, maybe nine months from now, about a year from now. And it's going to be this, you know, it's like the boa constrictor yeah. swallowing the thing. It's going to be this bubble of really, some of it's going to be terrible. Some of it's going to be the worst thing you've ever seen. Some of it's going to be really great. So one final question, which is, uh, we, we go into this thing, uh, assuming that Hollywood is a, an instrument of soft power for the nation. Uh, but in the end, uh, the reason that you want soft power is to achieve something economically. And that basically means American businesses and American brands do better globally. Now, if you look at the um, <clears throat> uh, film industry as a whole, although uh, it's risky business making films, the IP created by the American film industry in terms of... Um, merchandising and licensing and spin-off products and product placement is is pretty big you know what once they get successful they generate a lot of economic wealth um, and also american brands 
sort of went all over the world, you know, Coke and McDonald's and stuff, on the back of the favorable coverage coming from American films. Um, is that a reason why um, Hollywood will savagely rebound? Because they, they want to have that medium for promoting American business and brands. Or do you think that American brands are now going to struggle as all these other uh, sources of content arise? Um, I think that we probably think of Coca-Cola as an American brand, but if you're uh, in the C-suite at Coca-Cola, they think of themselves as a global brand first. And I think if you're looking at Netflix, Netflix thinks of itself as a global brand, global. They have Netflix, they have local, but they also have international and they also have, they bring a lot of the local stuff to the United States. I think all of these companies, especially the entertainment businesses, are starting to see the world as not just a place to sell, but also a place to buy. Um, and I think that is probably the biggest change in the past 15 years is that you, it is, you are legitimately searching for formats and actors and stories to tell. If you look at, um, you know, Disney, as always, is, not as always, but his past 50 years has been absolutely flawless. That, that, is, that is one of the best run, thoughtful, intellectual property companies in the history of uh, Bob Iger, as far as I'm concerned, is the, probably the smartest, best executive um, in the world. Um, and he has painstakingly with ego free assembled libraries and content and created a place where you could come up with animated material that is gigantic worldwide. And then you can buy animated material and buy stories and bring them into your company. Um, then I think that's the template for the future. That's the gold standard. Well, we've hit six, we've hit four o'clock, so um, I'm told that we've got to stop. Uh, it's been a fascinating presentation and discussion. Thanks a lot, Rob. It was really great. I hope when all the pandemic's over, that you will come to London and that we can actually entertain you at the RAC club and we can have a proper <laughs> dinner and all that kind of stuff. Um, so look for look forward to that when we're finally through all this. Uh, but thank you very much. That was really really interesting. Um, I'm going to hand to Zoe to just uh, sign off in a minute. But basically. This is talking about soft power and our next soft power report comes out on the 25th of um, February. Um, and we have surveyed 75,000 general publics worldwide and asked them what they think about many things, including what they think about things like culture from countries. So if anybody's interested, I hope you'll go and look for it. We're offering the data free at the, at the top level um, and it will make very interesting reading. So uh, thank you very much, Rob. And I hope everyone will tap into that resource. Uh, over to you, um, Zoe. Well, lovely. Um, thank you so much, David. Um, and as he said, it's just past four o'clock, so I'm afraid we're going to need um, to round off today's session. Uh, we had so many questions through. I'm terribly sorry um, we didn't get round to answering them all. Um, just want to take the opportunity to thank all of our participants for joining us today. And thank you so much to our speaker, Rob Long, um, for the very insightful presentation and um, excellent discussion. Um, I think um, we can all say we've been very well entertained um, over the last hour. It's just been fantastic. Um, again, thank you to everyone joining us today um, as David mentioned we'd, like, we'd be delighted if you would all join us at the Global Soft Power Summit 2021 on the 25th of February. The registration link has been included in the webinar chat um, so please do click through find out more information and um, register for the event. Um, any other questions please do let me know um, or email softpower at brandfinance.com and uh, again we'll keep you updated with future events and uh, look forward to connecting with you all soon. Thank you very much.